All right, now in Joshua chapter 7, this entire chapter is dedicated to the story of Achan. And um, we see here Achan commit this sin. And basically, you know, in, in where we're at in Joshua 7, just previously, was the famous battle of Jericho. Now, if you remember, Jericho was the city that the children, you know, this is the beginning of the book of Joshua, right? Moses had just led the children of Israel out of Egypt. They went through the wilderness for 40 years. Joshua was the one who was going to lead them into the promised land now. The, the torch was passed from Moses unto Joshua. Joshua leads them over um, into the promised land, and now we start to see the beginning phases of them, you know, having their battles and starting to, to win over and take over the promised land with Joshua at the helm, with Joshua leading the way. And the first major victory was that of Jericho. And Jericho, if you remember the story, they had it was a city that was at its great walls, and it was a you know it was a real defensive city, and and a city that people would look to and be like, man, there's no way you can crack their their defenses, right? Well, that was the city that the children of Israel they they circled it about once every day for seven days. They just they walked around it, no one said anything, and they they blew their trumpets, and then on the last day, on the seventh day, they went around the city seven times. They blew in the trumpets, everybody shouted and cheered, and then the walls just came crumbling down. And this was God's plan, this is what God told them to do, right? So there was this great victory, and, this, and, and it was evident that God was with them. It was a miraculous victory. God is fighting the, the battles for them as he promised to do. God's the one that promised to deliver them into the promised land. God's the one that said, I will do this. You know, don't worry about your enemies. I'll take care of them for you. I'm going to fight for you. And, and God tells them that over and over and over again. Well... Jericho was a major victory, right? So then we see here in chapter 7 that when they say like, oh, well, let's only send a few thousand men to Ai. Because now they're kind of living, you know, they're, they're, they're getting a little cocky. They're saying, oh, pff, well, there's not that many people there. Let's, only, let's not make everybody work. Let's just send a few thousand people to Ai. And, um, of course, they, they, are fle they flee before the people of Ai. And then they don't know what's going on. You know, Joshua's falling on his face and he's saying, God... What's going on? And he kind of just starts going like, would to God we would have been content on the other side of Jordan and, you know, that, that we would have just been happy with that. And, and God's just like, get up off your face. He's just like, like, what are you doing? It's like, get up off your face, you know, stop. This is happening because there's sin in Israel. <laughs> Someone has taken up the accursed thing. And this is, we're going to talk, this whole, this whole sermon tonight is going to be, I'm preaching on the sin of Achan. Okay, Achan was the one who took of the accursed thing, he hid it in his tent, and, um, and he caused all, all these problems for the, for the entire group of people, the entire congregation. All the children of Israel suffered because of this one man's sin. And we're going to take a look at this. Look at, if you would, at uh, verse number 20. Because now we're going to see Achan is answering to Joshua. He says, and Achan answered Joshua and said, Indeed, I have sinned against the Lord God of Israel, and thus and thus have I done. When I saw among the spoils a goodly Babylonish garment, and two hundred shekels of silver, and a wedge of gold of fifty shekels weight, then I coveted them and took them, and behold, they are hidden in the earth in the midst of my tent, and the silver under it. Now, this was a big deal. This was a sin because... Their instructions at the beginning was that they needed to just destroy this, to destroy the city, and that all of the spoils were was going to go to God. God was going to get everything. You know, it was going to go to the house of the Lord. And here's a man, Achan, right? They 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 fight this battle. You know, as the battle's over, or you know, the battle's ending, and he sees, you know, a garment. And today we might not, we don't think of, of clothing the same way, you know, you, with, with how cheap clothing is and, and how cheaply it's made. And, um, you know, it's, you can just run out to the store, you know, you, people have closets full of clothing these days. But back then in these times, it wasn't the same way. You know, they didn't have the factories mass producing these cotton shirts and everything else. So having a good, you know, having a good garment was very costly, it was expensive. You know, getting all the materials, getting the getting everything spun, and, and just being able to make clothing was was a lot more valuable than to have a change of garment, to have other clothing. I mean, there's a lot of people. The Bible talks about they only have like one change of garment, one one piece of clothing. 
And, you know, when you read about the Bible saying taking a pledge of somebody, like, like something that's their, um, like, collateral, uh, if, if you're making a business deal with someone, they say, okay, well, well, lend me this, and then I'll, and I'll pay you back. And they say, okay, well, give me a pledge. And they're like, well, give me this, uh, you know, I'll give you my clothing. And he's saying, you know, one of the laws was that, you know, if someone gives you their clothing, like, you have to give it back to them at nighttime because that's going to keep them warm as if, like, that was the only piece of clothing that they had. You know, and, and this, this is the value that they had on it. So he sees this, and I'm just saying all that just to kind of show you that, you know, like, like when he sees this, it's, you might just think, like, why, why does he care about a piece of clothing? It was valuable. It, it, was, it was a valuable commodity to have clothing. So he's like, well, cool, I'm going to get an extra piece of clothing. Right? I'm, I'm, maybe he only had one. I'm, I'm going to take this. Along with the, um, you know, 200 shekels of silver and a wedge of gold of 50 shekels. Wait, so that, that's worth quite a bit of money. So he sees this stuff. He sees it, you know, sitting there. Nobody saw him, right? He was able to just, just commit this sin. I covered him, took him, and um, seemingly got away with it. But let's, we're going to look in depth at, at how his sin happened because he explains exactly what happens here. In verse 21, the first thing he does, he says, when I saw among the spoils a goodly bad much going over this other stuff. First thing he did was he saw Right? This, is, this is the first step in his sin process. He sees it. Now, um, we don't always have control over the things that we see in our life. But there is a lot of things that we do have control over. And these are things that, because this, look, this is a sin process. He saw, he coveted, and he took. Those are the three things that Achan did, and it wound up having disastrous results. He saw, he coveted, he took. So the first thing he did was he saw. And like I said, you don't always have control over the things that you see, but there are things that you do have control over. The Bible says in Psalm 101, it says, I will behave myself wisely in a perfect way. Oh, when wilt thou come unto me? I will walk within my house with a perfect heart. So he's talking about walking within his house with a perfect heart. I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. I hate the work of them that turn aside. It shall not cleave to me. Now, when you're within your own house, do you have control over the things that you look at? Yeah. Absolutely. You're not, you're not subjected to outside influences when you're within your own house. If somebody is going to come into your house dressed and modestly, hey, you can kick them out of your house. Mm -hmm. If some, you know, when um, any decorations you hang up on the wall, hey, it's your house. You can take them down, right? I mean, it's kind of silly, but look, when you're within your own house, you have control completely over the things that come in front of your eyes. You do. And there's a lot of things that people do within their house. See, David said, I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. And he goes on to say, I hate the work of them that turn aside. It shall not cleave unto me. He, doesn't want, he has an attitude. I don't want to look at wickedness. I don't want it to cleave unto me. I hate the work of those that work wickedness. I hate it. He hates it so much, I don't even want to look at it. I don't want to see it. I don't want to set it before mine eyes. Where am I going with this? I'm sure you've heard this before. What about the television? Right? What about the things? That is something that you put in your house that you sit yourself down in front of and there are images that come up. Now, do you control everything that comes across the screen on the television? No. That is something that, that when you turn on that TV, you don't have control over what is going to be displayed to you. Whatever it be, you know, some kind of wickedness, whatever, whatever it is. You don't have control of that. Now, maybe there's some things that aren't showing wickedness, right? But you don't have control over what it's going to be. Think about this. Maybe you say, well, there's this TV show I like. and You know what? I know this TV show. There's nothing wrong with it. But what about the commercials? Mm -hmm. what, what about when something, you know, when something else comes up? You don't know what all the commercials are going to be. You don't know what that's going to be. Yeah. Hey, if you hate the work of them that turn aside and you don't want it to cleave unto you, you need to get that out. You need to not put that before your eyes. What about the movies, right? I mean, same thing, whether it's TV, movies, whatever. You have, and, and look, don't tell me that it's not wicked. When you have people committing fornication, committing adultery, you know, just basically being involved with all manner of sin. When you have sodomites just being exalted, okay, whether their character is a sodomite or whether they are in real life, Okay, I'm not going to take pleasure after a real-life sodomite, and they're playing a straight person on TV, though, so it's okay. No, I'm not going to have pleasure in their wickedness and in their sin and just look at those that just commit wickedness and abominations and say, I'm just going to put that in front of my eyes. 
And I'm going to take pleasure and that's how my entertainment's going to come from? No way. Okay, how about besides the TV and movies, commercials, what about web pages? When you go on the internet. Okay, there's a big one. And especially Facebook. So many people use Facebook. Look, I'm on Facebook, okay? So many people use Facebook. But here's the thing, depending on what kind of friends you have and everything else, you don't control all those things that pop up, on, that, that people put up, you know, pictures and, and videos and everything else that shows up. You have to be very, very, very careful with the things that you decide to put in front of your face. If you start noticing things that are, that are just wrong. I mean, this, when there's wickedness. Again, and this is for people who use the internet. If you just see this stuff, it's popping up. You need to stop doing that. You need to, you need to take control over what you're putting in front of yourself. Well, I didn't want it to be there. I didn't mean for it to be there, but it's there. Okay, you're exposing yourself to that. And if you don't have the proper hatred for sin, look, it should bug you enough to say, if this is what's going to come in front of my eyes, I don't want to see it because I don't want that to cleave to me. Wherever the source is coming from, whether it be from the TV, whether it be from the internet, whether it be from you know, web pages or whatever, look, and if you don't know this, there's lots of software to get rid of all the ads, you know, all the advertisements. I use that on the web browsers that I use to when, I, when I'm on the internet anywhere. They have ad blocking software, so you don't have to see any of that other stuff. You can still look at sites without having any of that other thing, things come across to you. But one of the biggest ones, one of the biggest ones I've noticed is Facebook. And that makes me, for one, to just clean up my, my friends list so that if there is anybody going to post anything like that, look, they're gone and I'm going to be my friends. And um, I don't, you know what, honestly, you ought not to be spending that much time on that stupid site anyways. Because what all it does is it seems to be a site that promotes, you know, people just kind of trolling around and snooping in other people's business and just, whether it be stalking or whether it just be just, just wasting time, I mean, just, just being busybodies and interested in what everyone else is going on. Now, again, I mean, it's not that it has zero function or zero use or it's all bad because it's not. But you get a lot of people that end up airing dirty laundry. They end up, you know, just, just talking about things that they ought not to be talking about. Um, it, it kind of promotes a lot of, a lot of this, um, like, pridefulness. I mean, selfie, like, like <laughs> selfies never existed before Facebook. You know, this whole, this whole fad of people taking pictures of themselves and then just posting it up, like, look at me. Oh, look at me. Oh, look at my new outfit. Oh, look at my new whatever. Oh, look at me. And posting these, these stupid pictures up and people making stupid faces and just, just posting them up online. Hey, everybody, look at me. And I'll tell you what, it, it might seem kind of funny, right? It might, it, it might seem harmless. Oh, what's the big deal? Oh, what are you getting so concerned about? It's not a big deal. We're just having some fun. You know what it is? It's a mindset of, of, of kind of switching your focus to, to now you're starting to think everything's about you. And you say, well, I don't think that way. Keep on doing these same things. Keep on, keep on indulging yourself in that. Keep on being exposed to other people doing it. And I guarantee you to have an impact on you. You may think, no, no, I'm above that. I can handle it. There is nothing that, that, no one is above sin. No one is above being able to, to handle this stuff, or, you know, to, to not have to handle this stuff. The Bible says, you know, let every man take heed lest he fall. Um, um, take heed unto yourself lest you fall. Because as soon as you think that you're invincible, that none of this stuff is going to affect you, none of this is going to bother you, it will. When you start having that, that type of an attitude. Okay, here's another one. Now, and this one is an example in the home, but we're getting into in the summertime. What about the public swimming pools? We've got men, we have women going into this place. Now look, you can control the places that you go to, okay? If you know of a place where people are going to be there and they're going to be naked, why in the world would you choose to go there or choose to bring your children there? If you know in advance, you say, you know what, I know that there's this place where people of the world go and they congregate and they gather together and the women are undressed and some of the men are undressed. And when I say undressed, no, I don't mean completely stark naked without a thread of clothing on, but I'm talking about the biblical definition of nakedness. The Bible says that if, if your thighs aren't covered, you're naked. 
Those are the words that the Bible uses. Okay, the Bible calls that nakedness. I didn't make up that definition. The Bible says that if you, when you expose your thigh, you're exposing your nakedness. You say, whoa, that's extreme. Well, that's what the Bible says. It's your nakedness. It's naked. So just as much as you'd say, well, I wouldn't want anyone to see me naked, well, do you want anyone to see you in, a, in your underwear? In, in a thong bikini or in, or in some small, you know, little outfit that's exposing all this stuff? Absolutely not. Do you want your kids just to see, okay, this is what people do, and we're going to bring them around, and you can just look at all these naked people? And that's, not, that's not somewhere I want to bring my children, and that's not somewhere where, where I'm going to choose to go, because I'm going to choose to keep my, first of all, to try keeping my eyes pure, and try to keep my eyes from seeing things that they ought not to see. Whether that comes from a television set, whether that comes from a computer, whether that comes from, from people in certain places that I already know that there's, that there's not going to be anything good for me to put my eyes on. Don't take these things too, light, too lightly, okay? Because this is where it starts. This is, this is where the whole, the whole thing starts. It'll start with your sight. And in this specific sin that we're talking about with Achan, Okay, and, and, and this type of a sin. And these are all things that you have direct control over. Okay, again, when you're driving in your car and, you know, driving to work or something, you don't necessarily have control, excuse me, over things that just happen in, out in the world. Okay, but these things you do, the things within your house, the places that you can choose to go to, you have control over that. And you ought not to, you ought to be aware of that and... and Either take the appropriate precautions or just don't go to the places at all if you know what's going to be there. Now, um, Joe, in Job 31.1, you know, he said, I made a covenant with mine eyes. Why then should I think upon a maid? So one of the ways that, that Job was, was able to keep himself from lusting after women, right, in his heart, which... Again, this is something that's probably a lot more common with men than with women, is, is looking at the opposite gender and, 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 and having those types of thoughts that you ought not to have because that's a sin. I mean, lusting, coveting after someone else's wife, or, or, or looking at a woman to lust after her in your heart, the Bible says you commit adultery with her already. It's a sin. You ought not to do it. People today say, oh, well, I could look as long as I don't do anything about it. Well, you know what happens when you look? Eventually, you probably are going to do something about it. But regardless of that, the Bible still says that even looking is a sin. Even if you never did act on it once in your entire life, it's still a sin just to do the looking and just to do that lust in your heart. Job made a covenant with his eyes. It's a promise. He decided, you know what? I don't want to even go to the point where I'm going to be thinking on a mate, so I'm going to make a promise with my eyes to where I'm not even going to look at it because the longer you look, the longer you gaze, the longer you stare, and you allow your eyes to feast on these things, that's when that sin is going to, is going to creep up in your heart. Your heart's going to just come up with these wicked thoughts and wicked imaginations because you're allowing your eyes to, to look upon. It only makes sense. I mean, your, your mind, your heart, the Bible says that the heart is wicked, right? The heart of man is wicked. And, and when you allow things to come in, to, to your eyes, to your brain, to your heart, and you, and you look on these things, hey, your, your heart's going to be left to its own imaginations, and, and you don't want that to happen, so you want to be careful with what's in front of your face. If, if everything's wholesome, it's a lot less likely that you're going to have your heart come up with, you know, with, with these sins, with, with these types of either covetousness or um, lust after, you know, after the opposite gender or whatever. Job made a covenant with his eyes. It's a smart, it's a wise thing to do. And, and one of the ways you can do that is just getting rid of, of anything that you have control over by saying, I am not going to allow this to come in front of my eyes. And you say, oh, but it's so much fun and I like this and my family's out. I would say, whatever. Well, look, if, it's, if, it's, if you already know that it's going to be a problem, is it really that big of a deal to just, to just cut it out of your life? I mean, like, what did you do before Facebook? Right, what did people do? Is it, is it really that big of a deal? I mean, in the grand scheme of things, like, oh, but I want to enjoy it. I want to do this. Well, at the cost of, of having wickedness come in front of your eyes? I mean, seriously, think about it. And again, I mean, everybody's situation, I'm sure, will be slightly different. And you say, oh, well, everything is fine of mine. I only have family members and everybody's, you know, also great. Okay, great, good. But I know for a fact that not everybody's like that. 
And a lot of people put up with things. And it's funny because even today, like a lot of people in, in fundamental Baptists, they won't put up with the TV. They've already been sold on it and they understand that and they all won't have the TV. But then it's the same thing going on on the computer. Well, I'll, I'll put up with this and I'll put up with that and I'll put up with this and I'll allow this to happen. Which is, it's like, well, you might as well just turn on the TV. And I mean, if you're putting up with all this junk on the computer, why, why, what's the difference between the, the, the mod, computer monitor and the, and the television screen? It does, it's not a difference. The difference is, is look, you got you to gotta stop being worried about the things that you really want to do and what your flesh wants to do if it's coming at a cost of exposing yourself to wickedness. That's the bottom line. No matter what avenue that comes in, if you're exposing yourself to wickedness, then you ought to just cut that part of whatever you're doing out. Because in the grand scheme of things, is it really that big of a deal anyways? Um, it's funny because I, I remember I remember when I stopped watching TV, television and movies and stuff. I remember you know, thinking that it was a lot bigger of a deal than it really turned out to be. Right? I mean, you think like, oh, but I love watching these shows. You know, like, like you get so much entertainment and just, it's just so fun to, to sit back and I want to follow these stories and what's going to happen. And, and you kind of just get wrapped up in these, in these stupid TV shows that are fake and they're not even real. You know, it has nothing to do with real life. It's, it's all phony, yet you get wrapped up in this stuff. And, and you just, you just want to see it for whatever reason. I mean, it's, just, it's your flesh. You want to see it. But once you get rid of it, I promise you this, it's like, I don't even think about that anymore. It's like, it's not even a thought. It never even comes up as just, as just oh man, I want to watch this TV show. Because like, you, you get over it, you get past it. There's so many other things to do with your time. So many other things. There are so many wholesome things. There are so many things you could do where you will not in any way be putting wickedness in front of your eyes. So much stuff to do with your time. So many enjoyable hobbies. So many things you can do. That, that even if it's not the Bible, I mean, just, just you have some recreation time, it doesn't have to be from a device or a source that's going to be putting wickedness in front of your eyes. Find something else to do. There are plenty of things to do. Um, the Bible says in 1 John chapter 2, it's 15, it says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Don't allow this love of the world and love of the world's programming, love of the world's internet, and love of the world's everything else to cloud you to, to where you're just loving that stuff because the Bible says if you love that, the love, of, the love of the Father is not in you. It says, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father but is of the world. And the world passeth away and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. You're saying, look, this stuff is just going to be gone anyways. I mean, we spend so much time and effort and, and just, you know, enjoying these stupid things, whatever. I mean, whether it's television program, whatever, you know, all these things, it's just here and gone the next day. I mean, think about sports, too. It's like one of those things where, you know, the Super Bowl comes every year and people make such a big deal and they hype it up and, oh, man, I can't miss the game. And I got to watch and watch and watch and I have to just have all my attention focused on this thing. And then the game's over, and then it's like no one even cares about it ever again. Yeah. It's just, it's gone and done, and it's passed away. It's over. Great. Uh, that's what you spent, you know, eight hours of your time every single Sunday for the past four months or whatever, all just glued to the television set, watching and watching and watching for this event. Okay, now it's over. And then you just repeat the cycle every single year. And um, it's, just, it's just a waste. It's just a waste of time. And, and especially the, the, the bigger problem, though, and what I want to focus on more, is when the wickedness is being put in front of your face. When, when, the, you know, when the beer ads come on. When the, when the, when the immodestly dressed women come on the TV. When, you know, when, when any, anything that comes up, when, when the sodomites come on the TV, when the hobos come on TV, whatever it is that's wicked, that you ought not to be looking at at all, hey, you have control over that. Just don't. Just choose not to do it. Believe me, you'll get over it. The second thing he did. Now that was that's that was all what he, he saw. Right? He saw with his eyes. That's the first thing that happened. What do you do after he saw? He coveted. Now covetousness is an extremely serious sin. It is a major sin. It it is a it is a a, a sin in your heart that's that that 
can be rooted and, and give and just produce all kinds of sin. This is this is this is a major thing to look out yeah. for today. And it's a major it's a major sin that I don't think in general churches gets an appropriate amount of attention getting preached on. Because especially in today's society, I mean Maybe it was different a hundred years ago, but in today's society, we live in a covetous society that's just cramming down your throat the commercialism and just, you need to buy this and this and you need to have this and people looking at each other and saying, well, this person has this and I want to have that and I don't live in a good enough house and I need to have a better car and I need to have this and I need to have that. And it's just, I mean, it's just everywhere. This is the type of attitude that's being, that's being thrown at you by the world to make a buck, right? I mean, they don't care. The, the people who are coming at you with all the advertising and everything else, they, they're just out to make a buck. They're just out to make a dollar. They don't care how much it's going to hurt people to, to have this type of a mentality and this type of a, an attitude about things in general. And we're going to get into this. The Bible says in Romans 7, 7, it says, What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid, nay, I had not known sin but by the law, for I had not known lust except the law had said, thou shalt not covet. So when we saw Achan, he said he coveted that stuff. And the reason why I'm bringing up this verse is because basically covet and lust are the same things. So whether we're looking at verses that talk about lust or whether we're looking at verses that talk about coveting, it's the same thing. And we saw that from Romans 7, 7 here, that um, the lusting, the coveting, it's all the same thing and it's all, it's all the same sin, it's wickedness. The Bible says in Proverbs 28, 16, it says, The prince that wanteth understanding is also a great oppressor, but he that hateth covetousness shall prolong his days. We need to get to the point where we hate covetousness. Turn to Luke chapter 12, hating it. I mean, when you think about it, because it's easy to fall into the trap of starting to get covetous, but I think a lot of people then will be like, oh, you can recognize it and say, oh, well, you know, I shouldn't do that. That's starting to maybe get a little covetous. No, you should just you should hate it. I mean, just just anything that has to do where, where it's coming up. Like, look, I don't want to be tempted to covet things ever. You, I, if you hate covetousness, the Bible says you prolong your days. And if you hate it appropriately, you're not going to want anything to influence you becoming covetous, right? I mean, again, it's 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 you want to take the precautionary steps to be like, look, I don't even want to get close to that. I don't want to see how close I can get to certain sins and dip my toe in the water and just start to see what it's like and say, well, I want to be right on the edge of sin, of living a sinful lifestyle. I don't want to be sinful. I don't, I don't want to live a sinful lifestyle, but I want to get, I want to get right up to that line. And I'm going to, I'm going to dangle my foot over. I'm going to see if I, oh, and then the next thing you know, I mean, you're, you're living that sinful life. You don't want to get caught. And covetousness is huge. We're going to see. We're going to see how bad of a sin this is. It, it is. It is. It can just. It will destroy your life. That's why the Bible says you hate covetousness. You're going to prolong your days because covetousness will destroy your life. If you don't hate covetousness, it will literally destroy your life. And this is an extremely common theme in the Bible. There's a lot of passages that have to do with covetousness, and it's extremely con uh, common especially today, and it's extremely dangerous. And that's why I have a tendency, and I don't know if you noticed, you know, I kind of hit on certain topics a lot, and um, I, try to, I try to keep myself balanced. But this is a, this is a problem, and I'm not saying it's a problem any, with anyone specifically in our church, it's just a problem in general in America. It's a problem that we all face probably on a daily basis that, that we need to be aware of, because, and this is extremely dangerous. But let's look at, you're in Luke chapter 12, look down at verse number 15. The Bible says, and he said unto them, Take heed and beware of covetousness. For a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesses. So first he's saying, look, you need to beware. Jesus is giving a warning. He said, beware of covetousness. And then he explains, look, your life, a man's life is not, does not, is not made up of the abundance of things that you can possess. He's saying that's not what life is all about. At all. I've heard people say, you know, not, you know, unbelievers, people say, like, oh, well, the person with the most toys wins. And that's how they live their life. I mean, they live their life, they go out, they work real hard, right? Maybe they, they, they just to earn a lot of money so that they can collect a lot of things and they say, I'm successful because I've collected all these toys and other people don't have as much as me. 
and, and, and I have all these fun things that I can do, and I win. And that's, that's their version of success. And Jesus is saying the exact opposite. He's saying, look, a man's life does not consist in the abundance of things that you get. It has nothing to do with it. Verse number 16, he says, And he spake a parable unto them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do? Because I have no room where to bestow my fruits. And he said, This will I do. I will pull down my barns and build greater. And there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said unto him, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then who shall those things be which thou hast provided? So is he that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. So he's saying there, look, and, and he has that qualifier too, because that's very important. He's not just saying anyone who has a lot of wealth is just automatically sinful. Like just because a person has wealth does not make you inherently sinful, right? Abraham and Isaac, we saw that this morning. I mean, they were men that, that had quite a bit of wealth. They became great men. They had a lot of stuff. Job was another man. He had a lot of wealth. He had a lot of things. But they were not sinful men. They were not... See, the, the, and the difference is this, is that it says, and is not rich toward God. See, it, it's how do you prioritize your life? Are you just going to be focused on the collection of things and, and, and increasing your wealth and just doing that? Or are you focused on serving God? Now, if you serve God and God decides to bless you with material wealth, praise God, amen, that's great. You know, there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah. But you need to be serving God. You need to be rich towards God. You need to have the attitude of just saying, you know what, I'm going to serve God with my life. Whatever other things happen, whatever wealth I attain, whatever level I get to financially is whatever it is, okay? But I'm going to be content with the things that I have and not worry and focus so hard on attaining whatever level of riches that you think you need to get to like this man did. I mean, this man was focused and he's saying, okay, well, I have all this wealth. Now I'm going to go serve God. Has anybody said no? He said, okay, well, I have all this wealth. Now I'm just going to build even greater barns and I'm just going to store all this stuff up and I'm going to mass, I'm going to lay everything up right here and then I'll take it easy. And God says, you're a fool. You're a fool. Look, your soul is going to be required of you tonight. You don't even get one chance to enjoy any of that stuff that you laid up for yourself. And then who's going to get it? You did all this work. You were, you, your whole life, you did all this labor. You amassed all this wealth. And then you're gone. Good job. Someone else is just going to go blow all that stuff that you just made. Congratulations. That's what God's saying. He's saying you're a fool. Instead, you ought to be rich towards God and lay up treasures for yourself in heaven. Now, if he had spent that same amount of time amassing all this wealth, but they were treasures in heaven, right? God would, come, would look at him and say, well done, now good and faithful servant. And I will set thee over ten cities in my kingdom. You know, I mean, that's the type of reward that he would get. Now, maybe in this life, if he had chosen that path, he'd be poor. Maybe he wouldn't even have a house. Maybe he'd be, you know, living in a trailer or whatever. I mean, whatever, whatever it is, you know, not having very much at all. You could spend your entire life with no riches, but that's why Jesus said, your life is not about the amount of things that you get and you can collect and, and, and how, you know, comfortable you can live. It says in verse 22 of there, Luke 12, it says, and he said unto his disciples, Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what ye shall eat, neither for the body, what ye shall put on. The life is more than meat, and the body is more than raiment. Turn, if you would, to Luke 16. And why are we going to know this? Because he started off in that parable, beware of covetousness, right? All, everything he just described is, is pertaining to covetousness looking at things. And what's covetousness? Ultimately, it's not being content with what you already have. Because you're looking at something that you don't have. Inherently, that's what covetousness is. It's looking at something you don't have and wishing you had that and wanting it. And especially when you have no means of obtaining it, it's not something that like, oh, hey, look, I've got, you know, 20 bucks in my pocket and that, that thing costs 20 bucks. I want that. Boom, I'm going to buy and take it. That's not covetousness. That's just, that's just use, you know, using your resources to buy something. Buying something isn't wrong. 
but looking at something being like, oh man, I mean, like, like our family, right? We're in zero position to buy just about anything, but we're, we're in zero position to say, like, buy a boat, right? But if we go out to, to Bass Pro Shops or we go out to Cabela's and we say, man, look at that boat. Man, what, wouldn't that be nice to have that boat? Man, taking the family out, go swimming, go fishing. And just, and just, and just thinking that, people will be like, that's a sin? There's something wrong with that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. that's abs that is covetousness. Because you're looking at something and saying, man, I wish I had that. Now, again, it's important to point this out because we just went to that expo at, at, at um, Brother Sebastian's work and there were all these RBs and stuff there. And even before we went, I was saying, you know, we got to be careful not to be covetous because it's cool to see this. I mean, there, you can look at someone and say like, man, that's cool, right? I mean, because it is, it's cool. But you got to be very careful not to look at it and be like, man, I wish I had this. Because now you've just crossed the line into, into just being covetous. Now, again, if you're going to look at it, and the whole, plan, the whole purpose for me even looking at something, I said this from the beginning, was that I want to look to see of what I can do and budget my money and say, I'm going to have a plan to, um, to have enough money. I need to know how much these things cost so that in the future, maybe you know, when I can afford something like this, I could plan to, to, to say, well, this is how much I'm going to need to buy it. It's a different scenario, right? Making a, looking at something that, that is going to be you know, within your realm of, of, of getting it and making a plan and, and saying, well, this is, this is what needs to be done, and you, know, you, you, you budget money and things like that. That's not coming just when you just start saying, like, man, I just wish I had this. Right? And, and just, that's covetousness. And, um, and we, need to, we need to be aware of that. And we need to be aware of focusing too much, especially on, on all of the things and the cares of this world. Right? You, you need to be, to be careful not to get too wrapped up in these things. The Bible says that in Luke 16, look at verse number 13. Luke 16, 13, the Bible says, No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. Ye cannot serve God and mammon. And the Pharisees also, who were covetous, heard all these things, and they derided him. Mm -hmm. The Pharisees were covetous. They wanted things they couldn't have. They cared about money. They loved money. They wanted to have more money. They heard what God was saying there, what Jesus was saying there, and they derided him. They, they didn't like hearing that. It, it, it stuck, it, you know, it stuck in their hearts. They didn't, they didn't like to hear that. But he's right. The Bible, I mean, Jesus said, no servant can serve two masters. You, you can't serve God and mammon. Mammon is money, right? You can't be just focused and serving and say, okay, I'm going to be your servant. Right? I'm going to serve you. This is what I'm going to do. I'm going to work hard and I'm going to work on making money. And I'm going to work on just making more and more money and you're not going to serve God. If that's your goal, if that's what you're doing, if you're saying, you know, I'm just going to, my goal is just, I'm going to try to make as much money as I can, you will not serve God at all. You can't. But I was saying, look, you're going to love the one and hate the other. And those are strong words, right? That's what he said. He said, you're going to hate the other. You're going to hate, you're not going to want to serve God. You're going to be hating God when you, when you just love money and just decide that that's what you're going to live for and that's what you're going to do. The Bible says, but... If you're going to serve God and love Him and choose to serve Him, then you're going to hate, you know, the, the covetousness. You're going to hate trying to just to, to make all that money because it shouldn't matter at all, right? If you're if you're going to serve God, then you're going to need to be content in your heart and be and be thankful of the things that you have instead of being worried about how much more you can amass to yourself. Um, <clears throat> so those are the first two things, right? What did Achan do? First, he saw. Then he coveted. And then what's the next thing he did? He took. Right? He saw the garments. He saw the gold. He saw the silver. He coveted them in his heart. He wanted them. And it was covetousness because he wasn't supposed to have them. It wasn't for him. He knew he couldn't take it. If it, it, it was for God, it was not for him. It wasn't his. It didn't belong to him. He coveted it. And then he took it. Now, I believe this firmly. Eventually, after enough of looking on something and enough of coveting, you're going to act. That's just the logical next step. So, and this is why it's so important too, the things that you put in front of your eyes, the more wickedness that you put in front of your eyes, the more people you see, whether it be on TV, 
or whatever that, that, that are involved in these relationships and you start hearing these stories and oh, you know, you start to have sympathy for the person, you know, who, who cheated on their spouse and oh, but you don't understand the circumstances and of course the movies and the TV, they'll give you all these circumstances that are all fake anyways, but I mean, they, they make it up and they'll, and they'll make it look like, oh, oh, I, you know, I kind of feel bad. Oh, I can kind of see why, why he would do that. Oh, well, you know, his wife wasn't, wasn't paying enough attention to him. And, you know, yeah, he shouldn't have done it. But, you know, you start getting a soft spot for this sin. And, and, and that is extremely dangerous. We need to hate that sin. Don't even let it come close to you. Hey, look, don't start getting this soft spot in your heart for sin. As soon as you start doing that, as soon as you start seeing, oh, well, I can see how it could happen, and just having so much sympathy for, for, for that type of sinful, and you start seeing it, and then you start seeing it over and over and over again, and, and that's, hey, every story, there's always something going on like that, right? I mean, isn't that what's always going on in the soap operas? I, I've never watched soap operas, I don't know, but I mean, isn't that what they're about? I mean, come on, come on. Probably. You, My mom <laughs> oh. <laughs> Look, that's what they're about. Okay, I don't even, I don't even have to see them. I know what they're about yeah, because the ladies are all about the drama and stuff and all these stupid things that are going on. And I've heard enough about it growing up from, from, from girls that like watching those things. Look, the soap opera, it's not just a soap opera. I mean, there's, there's modern day soap opera. That's what, that's what reality TV is, right? Reality. Yeah. They call it reality, but it's all scripted anyways. But, but it's all about this drama, and what better drama can they have than, than these relationships with men and women, right? And, and, and married men, married women, whatever, going out and doing these things. And then you start to see this, this pattern over and over and over again. And you sit down in front of that TV, and maybe you watch it for an hour or two every day, every single day, and at least one time, that wickedness is just, is just brought in front of you, brought in front of you, brought in front of you. You know what? You're going to not have the proper hatred for that wickedness when you're just, just allowing that to come into your eyes, allowing sin. You say, oh, well, I would never do that. Well, you keep on feeding your mind with this stuff, then maybe you find yourself in some similar situation to, to what was played out on TV. You're going to be a lot more likely to have those thoughts going through your head because they've already been exposed to you. You've already, you've already thought about it, and you're not going to have that proper hatred for those sins. You'll be a lot more likely to act on them through your continual looking at them, and then and then eventually that's going to start coming. I mean, you start looking at all these other ladies or all these other men on TV, and oh man, they're they're great, and they you know they do all these other things, and my relationship isn't like that, right? You say, oh well, well their relationship is perfect on TV. Of course, again, a full of lies, right? Just you have these people have these perfect, no problems, everything's just fine. And, and, oh, I wish my husband would do that for me like he did for that, you know, or whatever. And, and it's wicked. I mean, you get these thoughts, yeah. and, and, and you allow this to affect your brain. And, and it affects everybody. Look, no one is immune to this. Mm -hmm. To some level, no one is immune to this at all. What you see, what you decide to look at will have an impact on you. And it was actually it was interesting. I was talking to a guy yesterday at the expo, uh, someone from the Oath Keepers, and, he, and we were talking about, you know, um, I don't know, we're talking about the Bunny Ranch and saying this stuff, and I said, look, I don't watch TV, you know, and he's like, good, you know, like, he's like, I don't either, you know, and he's like, I have friends that, that, well, they say, well, I watch the news, and he was saying that, um, and he's like, he basically was saying that they're wasting their time, you know, like, he's like, you spend an hour watching the news, and of course, you know, he's talking about, like, the mainstream news, the CNN, and the Fox, and everything else, and it's like, it's so, it's so twisted and slanted. They're not giving you the truth. Mm -hmm. They're just giving you their spin on some story, and they're giving you the talking points that they want you to be focused on. Yeah. They're already leading you down that path, and he's saying, look, you just wasted an hour of your time. You can't get that back. So I mean, like, like, him and I were on the same page with this stuff, but he's saying this stuff. He's like, why even bother with that? And even people, and, and we were talking about this, that even people like, like him and I, right, we're aware of the, of the um, propaganda. We're aware that, that there's lies and these things happen, but if you decide to just keep on watching it, even though you know it's wrong, even though you know, it's still going to impact the way that you think. It'll even impact the, what your, your focus and what your attention is on because they control the talking points. Even on things like the news, right? I mean, a story happens, something happens. One, they'll bring up some little distraction side point on it, and then everybody's talking about that one little point instead of... 
the way more important aspect of the story or whatever. And even knowing about this, as human beings, no one is above this. Uh, you know, to some degree, it's going to impact you as well. Um, so the whole point of, of going in that story is just, you might think you could say, oh, well, I could recognize the sin, and I know it's wrong, so I'm not going to let it impact me. But it will. Okay, you expose yourself to it, you look upon it, it's going to get into your brain, and it will have an impact on you. Achan saw, he coveted, and then he ended up taking. The Bible says in, um, in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 8, it says, And having food and raiment, let us be there with content. Again, if you're content with what you have, you won't be covetous. If you could look at your life and say, I am thankful God has blessed me and has given me everything that I have in my life. I don't need anything. I am completely satisfied with everything God has done for me. That is completely the opposite of being covetous. Because you could just live and just be completely, completely covetous. Instead of having food and raiment. I know for a fact that everybody in this room today has more than just food and clothing. Everybody here does. And we all ought to be more than content with what we have. Because if we just had food and clothing, he didn't even say a house. He didn't even say a place to put, to, to put your head under. He said food and clothing. Do you have some clothing on? And again, the people back there, sometimes they had one, one piece of clothing. You have, if, you have, if you're just able to be dressed and cover your body with clothing, even if you only have one piece of clothing and you're able to eat, and it clearly says we ought to be content with that. But think about that. It's, it's easy to agree with that now in our, in our current situation when we have abundance, when we have so many things, when we got a refrigerator full of food and you have a closet full of clothing. But really think about it. Would you be content if God took everything away from you and all you had left was food and clothing? Would you be content with that? And think about this seriously because we ought to. We ought to. God says that we ought to. But... Keeping that type of a humble attitude is really, really, really important because it could be so easy to, to, because of our abundance of things, to start getting this attitude of, well, we deserve all this stuff. I have all this stuff because I work for it and I deserve it, right? Instead of being humble about it and thinking that, well, God blessed me with this stuff and I'm thankful for it and I appreciate it and, and it's not just because I deserve everything, it's just, it's... You know, I'm going to be happy with what I have and what God has blessed me with. So, I mean, if God has allowed you to be physically fit enough to do a lot of hard work or to have a mental capacity to do a certain type of job that pays well or something, hey, it's not from your own doing. God's given you that gift. Thank Him for that, right? No matter what you're doing that's allowing you to even make some kind of income, it's not just all because you're such a great person and because you've done so much work. Look, God's given that to you. Every good gift and every perfect Give comes from above, from the Father of lights. The Bible says in 1 Timothy 6a, where I already saw, and having food and raiment, let us be there with content, but they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare. Now that word will means wants. Like they that, that want to, they that will, that's their will, that's what I want to do. I want to be rich. It says they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. Again, I said earlier, covetousness will destroy your life. Remember when I said that? Covetousness will destroy your life. The Bible says that they that will be rich, talk about wanting to be rich, wanting to have something you don't have, wanting to amass riches of yourself, that's covetousness. It says they, they fall into temptation, a snare, and into many foolish and hurtful lusts. Again, what's another word for lust? Covetousness which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil. Covetousness will destroy your life because the love of money is the root of all evil. All the bad things that happen, all the pain that's inflicted on people, the Bible says that it's from, and it all stems from. When you get down to the root, now no, up at the surface, up at the top of that, you might not see the love of money and, and whatever evil happens, when you see a person raping another person, you say, well, where's the love of money in that? The Bible doesn't say it's at the, 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 at the leaf. It says it's at the root. Yeah. So you have to dig down and you start looking into that person's behavior that, that committed that act of evil upon another person. And ultimately, what do you end up doing? I mean, rape is you're taking something from someone else 
right? You're satisfying yourself in a certain way against their will, something that you just want to have because you're thinking about yourself. It's a selfish attitude. Covetousness is a selfish attitude. I want. I want that. I'm not happy. I want that. I need this to satisfy myself. It's a selfish attitude. And we need to be the exact opposite. We need to be selfless. That's the, that's the example that Jesus Christ set forth for us. He's the one that came and died on the cross, not for himself. He didn't die on the cross and bear our sins and go to hell for three days and three nights before rising again from the dead for himself. None of the work that he did on this earth was for himself. He didn't go out and have no certain dwelling place and have nowhere to live and, and get mocked and ridiculed and stay up half the night and pray and go and, and perform miracles on other people for himself. He didn't make himself rich. He wasn't out, you know, you know, oh, well, I could do all this stuff, but give me some money. That's not what he did at all. That's not what he stood for. He was a, he was a minister. He went out to help other people. And that's the example that we ought to have. Look, was he thinking about himself ever in any of what he did? No. He never put himself first. He was never thinking that, oh, man, why do I have to do this? I wish I could just go do something else. Because that would have been sin. That would have been covetous. He would have been thinking, like, no, I want to do this for myself. He was not focused on himself at all. The entire time of his ministry, he was focused on others. He had to be. If he wasn't, he wouldn't have been able to go through with the suffering and the, and the mocking and the torture and the bearing of sins on the cross. And, and to the point to where God didn't even want to look on him when he broke, bore our sins on the cross. Because he had others in mind. He was not thinking about himself at all. We need to have the same type of attitude where, where we're not focused on ourselves. It doesn't matter. Hey, the amount of money we have, it doesn't matter. The type of house we have, it doesn't matter. The type of car we have, it doesn't matter. Because I'm going to be worried about what other people do. I say, how can I benefit someone else? How can I help that person? So we see Achan's story here. He, he saw, he coveted, and he took. Now, you know, the example I was given, of, you know, the Bible says the love of money is the root of all evil. And I was given an example about rape or like other, you know, there's other forms of evil. But in, in Achan's case, he was actually stealing. Right? When he took, he was stealing. He was stealing something. Not only did it not belong to him, but it belonged unto God. And, um... In Joshua 6, where we were, where we started off, turn if you would to Malachi chapter 3. But in Joshua 6, verse 18, where we were, it says, And ye in any wise keep yourselves from the accursed thing, lest ye make yourselves accursed when ye take of the accursed thing and make the camp of Israel accursed and trouble it. But all the silver and the gold and vessels of brass and iron are consecrated unto the Lord. This was, the, this was what, what they were told before the battle, right? This is what they were told. Saying, look, all the silver, all the gold, all the vessels of brass and iron, they're consecrated, they're set apart unto the Lord. They shall come into the treasury of the Lord. So because that's what the commandment was, when he took that, hey, that belonged to God. They had already set apart. They said, look, in this battle, all the silver, all the gold, everything belongs unto God. We're going to give that unto God. Achan took it, he was stealing from God. He coveted and, and, and he, um, he stole from God. Now, we're not going to war at God's commandment anymore these days like he was here. You know, God was commanding them to go and, and to, to wipe out the people that were in the promised land that was given to him because he was also, not only was he giving them, you know, the promised land that was promised unto Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but he was also... Um, Pouring out, you know, bringing his judgment upon wicked nations because all the nations that were in there were wicked. God had devised his plan and his timing because he knew they were going to be extremely wicked. And at one point, he's able to, to do good and, and bring blessings upon his people, the people who were living godly, and Abraham, you know, God blessed him. And he said, Look, this is what I'm going to do for you because you're being so righteous. Now, of course, in order to give him that stuff, it's got to come from someone else, right? At least at that time, and the land that he gave him belonged to someone else. 
But it works out because he knows, you know what, they're going to be wicked anyways, and I want to take away from them. I want to wipe them off the earth for all their wickedness and all the abominations that they're doing. And God had the perfect plan, and he, you know, that was his plan for this to happen. But anyways, you know, so that's why God was leading them into war to bring his judgment upon these nations. Now, we don't have that today, so you can't say, oh, well, we're not stealing from God today because we're not, um, you know, we're not going to war, and I don't, I don't have to worry about this like Achan did. But what about in tithes? The Bible says that, that you know, the tenth of our increase belongs unto God. That one tenth of what we make belongs to God. That's God's money. That's not ours. And it explains that here in Malachi chapter number three. I don't think I've preached about tithing yet in this church because honestly, like, like we're not focused on money at all. You know, I'm not focused on like, oh, well, we need money and I need money and the church needs money and everything else because we're not money oriented. But the Bible definitely talks about tithing. And we're going to read this here in, in Malachi chapter 3. And it talks about stealing from God. We saw Achan stole from God. And, and I would be remiss not to preach on this subject because, hey, if you're, if you're lacking in any area of your, of your Christian life, you know, you need to know about it. And if this is one of those areas, then, you know, I'm, we're going to cover it a little bit tonight. Look at Malachi chapter 3. Look at verse number 8. The Bible says, will a man rob God? Are you going to steal from God? Yet ye have robbed me. But ye say, wherein have we robbed thee? And he answers them, in tithes and offerings. Ye are cursed with a curse, for ye have robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house. And prove me now herewith, said the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. So he's saying that, look, you're cursed because you've robbed me. And I don't know about you, but I don't want to be cursed by God in any manner for any reason whatsoever. But he's saying, look, if you're going to steal from me, from like from God, right, not me personally, but if you're going to steal from God, right, he's going to curse you. And, and his people are saying, well, what, what do you mean? We didn't, steal. how did we steal from you? We're not, we're not stealing your money. God, what do you mean? In not giving God what belongs to him, you're stealing from him. When you hold back what already belongs to God, I mean, all, going all the way back, you know, from the, from the Levites that were separated, from, you know, when, when God saved the children of Israel out of Egypt and he smote the firstborn son, he said, already the firstborn belongs unto him, and he sets apart the Levite. And this is where all the, like, like the ties get started with this, but... What was the point of it, though? He says, bring you all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be meat in mine house, in God's house. That's why we still um, honor or respect the tithe today because God still has a house today. Now, it's not the tabernacle. It's not the temple, right? But the local church is still referred to as God's house. And the reason why he has people tithe, it's, it's, it's to continue his work. Not that God needs money, but God says, look, there needs to be um, meat in my house. There needs to be food. There are people like pastors and deacons that are administrating the church and, and that are running things. And the Bible says it's very biblical for them to be paid. And the way that they get paid is from the tithes and offerings, from the money that comes in. Look, God wants meat in his house. He wants people dedicated to serving him. He knows we have needs. And, and have families that support other things that, that, you have to, that, that in this world cost money. That it's going to cause some money to, to, to get food and to, and to sustain your family. And he's saying, look, the, the, the elder that, that serveth well is you know, he's worthy of double honor. That um, you know, these things, that there's nothing wrong with, and, and the pastors ought to be paid. Um, and the way that you do that is with the tithes and offerings. And he's saying, look, the tithes and offerings belong unto God. Now, um, that's what Achan did. He stole from God. And again, it's just a warning so that we don't steal from God uh, today in our life by, by not giving the tithe and the offering. But um, let's continue on here. Um, now, as a result of Achan, I'm going to finish with this. As a result of Achan's sin, back to the story here in Joshua in chapter 7, you know, God departed from all the children of Israel because of Achan, right? The action of one man caused God to depart from all of them. 
when they went into battle at Ai, God was not with them at all, all because of the actions of one person. And, and let that sink in, one for the, an individual, right? How would you like it if, if, if something impacted you because of what someone else did? First of all, I mean, think, just, just think about that from your, from your own perspective and be like, I didn't even do anything, and now I'm going to suffer because of what this person's doing, right? Well, now flip that around and think about yourself when you get into sin. Right? If you start having that covetous attitude, if you look, if you, if, if you see, if you covet and take like Achan did, hey, you could be the one now affecting a bunch of other people that had nothing to do with your sin. You might say, well, no, you know, like, no one else has anything to do with my covetousness. That's in my heart. Well, no one saw what Achan did. No one noticed that that stuff was missing. Right? It, on, on the outside, it didn't appear like it affected anyone else. But did it affect everyone else? Of course it did. The Bible says um, in Joshua 7, 11, it says, Israel has sinned, and they have also transgressed my covenant, which I commanded them. And look, it, he's using the words, Israel had sinned. Achan is the one who did the sinning, but he says, Israel had sinned, and they have also transgressed my covenant, which I commanded them, for they have even taken of the accursed thing, and have also stolen and dissembled also, and they have put it even among their own stuff. Therefore the children of Israel could not stand before their enemies, but turn their backs before their enemies, because they were accursed. Neither will I be with you anymore, except ye destroy the accursed from among you. And this is the end result of Achan's and, and all covetous sins. The Bible says in James chapter 1, verse 14, it says, but every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust. And again, lust, another word for covetous, is covet, um, coveting. Every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Covetousness will destroy your life. Having lust... It conceives, it brings forth sin. At the end, when sin is finished, it brings forth death. <clears throat> Achan's punishment. What did they punish him with? If you remember, we read this in the beginning of the chapter, in chapter 7 of Joshua. What ended up happening to Achan? I'll reread it for you in verse 24 of Joshua tw uh, 7. It says, And Joshua and all Israel stood with him. Um, and Joshua and all Israel with him took Achan, the son of Zerah, and the silver and the garment, and the wedge of gold, and his sons, mm -hmm. and his daughters, and his oxen, and his asses, and his sheep, and his tent, and all that he had. And they brought them unto the valley of Achor. Joshua said, Why hast thou troubled us? The Lord shall trouble thee this day. And all Israel stoned him with stones, and burned them with fire after they had stoned them with stones. And they raised over him a great heap of stones unto this day. So the Lord turned from the fierceness of his anger. Wherefore, the name of that place was called the Valley of Acorn to this day. He lost everything. Every, his family, his goods, the stuff that he stole. I mean, it mentions that off specifically. The gold, the silver, the garments, in addition to, to everything else that he had. Everything that he did was, um, was destroyed. God took it, he destroyed it, and... Um, he lost it all. His life was destroyed because of his covetousness. Because, because of one moment he had in the tent, looking on something, lusting after it. Now, was it worth it just to have a, little, a few riches? No, of course, I mean, it's, of course not. Of course it wasn't worth it. But we need, this, and again, this is a perfect example of how serious of a sin covetousness is. Covet covetousness is. How serious it is. I mean, we might think about it in our, in our minds, in our human minds, in our fleshly minds, in, in the way that this world is, we think it's not that big of a deal. Everybody does it. It's not that big of a deal. Is it a big deal? I cost this man his life, his family, and everything that he had. And that's the way God viewed it. And because of that, that is what they had to do for God to turn away the fierceness of his wrath. 
That's how angry God was. He said, look, you have to get this wickedness out. And that is what he prescribed for them to do. They didn't come up with that solution on their own. That is the solution that God gave for them to do, is to take him and everything he had, stone him with stones, and just get rid of it. Get rid of that covetousness. It can't be among you. Now, look at how many other people were affected by Achan's own personal sin. There were 36 people, 36 people that died in that war against Ai, where they were turned and fled away. 36 people lost their lives because he committed sin and God wasn't with them anymore. It was his fault. It was his covetousness that caused 36 other people to lose their lives. And again, he probably didn't even know it, right? He's oblivious to the fact that his own actions had that type of effect on other people. Remember this. When you sin, when you have the covetous attitude, when you have these types of sins in your life, it's not only affecting you. You might want to think that it is. You might want to fool yourself and say, look, no one else is affecting me. No one else is around me. This is in my heart. I did this thing. It's between me and God, and that's it. That's not the way it works out. You will affect, he affected his family, everything he had, and just a bunch of other people, 36 other people, lost their lives because of his own sin. Remember that when, when the next time... I mean, again, I'm not, I'm not blowing this out of proportion. This is what the Bible teaches. In all these verses we looked at, it's talking about covetousness destroying your life and losing everything. And look, it's not worth it. What do we need to do? We need to be content with what we have. Just be, just be happy. And look, it, it, it's... It'll make you happier anyways in your life. When you're always looking for something else, when you always want to just have more money, when you always just want to have more things, you're never satisfied. You will never be satisfied in life because you're always going to want more. And that's a bad feeling to have. It's a bad way to live your life. You will never be just at peace. But if you're content with what you have, you will be at peace. You, you, can, you, can, just, you can just be content, right? And then, on top of that, you won't destroy your life. God will bless you. He'll lead you. He'll, he'll, he'll guide your steps. It's so important. It's something that we, we... Be diligent about it. Be diligent about what comes before your eyes. Be diligent about, about what you're focusing on in your heart so that you don't end up following through that and even committing some, some worse sins. And, and don't let covetousness rule your, uh, ruin your lives. That's about right as a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you so much for the Bible. God, we, we live in, a, in perilous times, in, in, in God, in a society where everything seems to be focused at putting things in front of our face and trying, you know, so many advertising campaigns and... and other people's attitudes, dear Lord, we, we've gotten into this uh, society where everybody is so focused on, on just amassing and accumulating more wealth and more things and more gadgets and more toys. God, I pray that you would please help us to have wisdom. Lord, help us to remember this story of Achan, that if nothing else from, from, from his sins and, and everything that happened to him, that we can, have, we can remember this story so that we don't fall into that same trap, so that we don't destroy ourselves with covetousness, dear Lord. Help us just to, to be mindful every day that, that after today, when we go our separate ways, dear Lord, after hearing your word, that, that tomorrow and Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday and Friday in our lives we'll remember and, not, and, and catch ourselves so that we don't allow ourselves to become covetous, dear Lord. Help us to just, to just be thankful and not worry so much about all the things that we need or want to attain, but focus more, first and foremost, on serving you and just, and just focused on, on trying to understand what do you want us to do? Instead of worrying, what do I want to do? What do you want us to do, Lord? Please help us to have this type of an attitude and please, and please instruct us and guide us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.